All right. I am here with Spencer Harmon, and we are here with you. And if you are listening to this, you have made it to week seven, the final week of the What Happened at First Baptist podcast. And this is week seven Q&A. One of my favorite things in this whole project has been answering these questions. Uh, I have loved hearing from you through Spencer. I've loved thinking about uh, the kinds of things that are of interest to you. I used to say in my former life as a professor that, you know, I had to stand up and give lectures and give talks all the time. But my favorite part was Q&A because when I stood to speak, I was hoping I was being relevant. But when I was answering a question, I was sure I was being relevant. Mm -hmm. I was sure I was saying something that mattered. So I've loved these Q and A's. And Spencer, do you know what I realized? What? I was listening to uh, the Wednesday podcast and I heard the credits. And do you know the one name we did not put in the credits is Spencer Harmon, the questioner on the Q and A episodes. We really? didn't. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, am I wrong about that? I'm not wrong. Yeah. I'm Caroline Haley, whose knowledge is authoritative on this, is looking at me and going, <laughs> you did not get gratitude on the credits. And so I right now, before we get started, I want to thank <laughs> Spencer Harmon, without whom <laughs> without whom what happened at First Baptist would not have been possible. Can, can I start out this last episode by asking you a question? What? On a scale of one to 10, how bad are your feelings hurt? Well, <laughs> what people don't know is that I, I told Heath that I wasn't going to host this last episode unless he thanked me publicly. Yeah, you, you can let go of my arm now. <laughs> <laughs> That's very There kind. it is. Very, very kind. But we couldn't have done it without you. We are very, very thankful. You have been reading all the questions. You have been prioritizing them. You've been collating them so that similar questions get bunched together and you've been asking them to me. So we are most, most grateful for all of your work. It's been a joy. I'm thankful to do it. And uh, we should get started and talk about some of them because uh, you were at the last week, last episode, episode seven stand and a lot of the questions that are coming in this week, honestly, it's been a smorgasbord of questions because we've got people asking questions about all the episodes, people kind of asking summary questions, but then we'll, we'll ask some, uh, particularly about the episode. But the first one... It uh, all, before you uh, cut you off, yeah, since we're just freewheeling yeah, here at the very beginning. Go for it. <laughs> just whatever. It's been no seven weeks. Here we are. <laughs> I just blew in from Richmond. I'm exhausted. <laughs> so who knows what's, <laughs> what's going to happen here. Uh, but... Um, Oh, now, what was I going to ask? Oh, see, this is, this is what we're <laughs> <We're> coming in <laughs> hot. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, I do remember what do I was going to Do you remember what it was? Yeah, I do remember. Okay. Yes. So I, I meant to say at the very beginning, uh, though this is the last week, we do have supplemental content that we are going to be dropping in the weeks ahead. In the weeks ahead. Uh, they're working on that in post-production right now. And maybe we'll see. I mean, uh, just keep us posted. If there are a lot of questions that come in, yeah. I'd be happy to do a supplemental yeah. Q&A. So, so maybe this won't be the last week for Q&A if people continue to send stuff into yeah. what happened at fbcjacks.com. An encore song. We'll have the crowd cheering one more episode. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> all right, now I'll really shut up and defer all right, to you. All right, so first question is one of those summary questions. Um, thinking about everything that's happened through all these episodes, we had one listener write in and say, what about spiritual warfare? They said, when I listen to this podcast and I hear that there's a longtime member of our church that wrote this in oh. and saying when I listened about what happened at first, it just seems like a coordinated satanic attack, like yeah. on the church. Um, I want you to talk about how you've thought about that and reflected on that and all the pain that has happened at our church, but also just speaking to pastors and ministry leaders, how important is it to recognize satanic opposition in ministry? Mm -hmm. So I think that is a very relevant point. We talked about this just a little bit uh, in a prior episode. Uh, I talked about it. I'll say some more about it in a second. Uh, folks might remember uh, Dave Bristow, who was one of my very dear friends at First Baptist. I 
would not be at First Baptist, and I might not even be alive if it weren't for Dave Bristow, just an incredibly godly, faithful servant of the Lord Jesus in a First Baptist church. Uh, I interviewed him for the podcast. He died uh-huh. uh, right uh, at the very beginning of this year, right in January. Um, and uh, just a month or two after after I had interviewed him, very, very faithful man. We used a number of his clips in the in the podcast. And one of the things that he said, his simple description was the devil got in the middle of our church. Mm. And I think that's I think that's a fascinating description. And I think it is theologically accurate. Okay. Uh, so in in Second Timothy, chapter two, starting in verse twenty four. It says, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. So the... Apostle Paul is writing to his pastor protege, Timothy, and he's like, he says in so many words, I mean, the, the Dave Bristow paraphrase would say, the devil's going to get in the middle of your church. Huh. There are going to be people who look like church members, who look like leaders, who are people of influence, huh. but they have been captured by the devil to do his will for a huh. time. Um, listen, the devil does love to do damage to the body of Jesus Christ. And the question is, how would you recognize it? Uh, and there, there's a lot that we could say about this. I'd say a few things. I'd say one in, in revelation chapter 12, verse 10, uh, the Bible calls the devil, the accuser of the brethren. Uh So in your church, you're looking for accusers, Uh and accusations. The people who are stacking up accusations, the Uh people who are the accusers, maybe they're doing it online, maybe they're doing it on social media, uh, maybe they are circulating petitions or whatever. The accusers, I'm I'm not talking about people who have legitimate Uh concerns and they are handling those concerns in biblical ways. Jesus gave us biblical processes to handle legitimate concerns. Uh I'm talking about people who are going rogue and accusing people. Uh, Then you've got laws uh, in in John chapter eight, verse 44, Jesus says the devil is the father of lies. Uh So where we're seeing just an increase, uh, sort of an inflammation of lies, we are seeing the work of the devil. And then in, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, I talked about that a little bit this week where Jesus promises to grow his church and the gates of hell will not prevail Uh against it. So hell is opposed to the growth of the church. Uh, And when you have people who are coming along and you've got somebody who's standing up and saying, we need to take faithfulness and stretch it out into the future. And you've got people who are opposing that you're seeing the gates of hell. Anybody who is more committed to fighting for what the church was yesterday Uh than they are to helping the church get to where it needs to be tomorrow is somebody who is serving in the role of the devil. Hmm, that's really helpful. Okay. So now let's, let's zoom in a little bit to the episode. So we talked about the sexuality statement, the first Baptist statement on biblical sexuality. And one of the, one of the themes that was in the, the story episode is I think this idea of theological triage, right? And what, what I mean by this is the ability of a Christian leader, pastors, ministry leaders to look at all the issues that we could address in our church publicly and say, that's the one that's most important because of scripture, because of our ministry context, etc. This episode gets me wondering about theological triage. So how can we know which ministry issues need to be addressed right away and which ones need to wait yeah. and talk about later? So let's talk ministry issues and theological issues because you had to do that with the sexuality statement. Right. So it's interesting. I think Christians, particularly in our circles, particularly in Southern Baptist, conservative, evangelical circles, we've given a lot of thought to theological triage because a couple of decades, Al Mohler, he wrote that uh, article that was very influential about Mm -hmm. theological triage. And there's primary issues and secondary issues and tertiary issues and primary issues. Um, have to do with you can't uh, basically you can't be a christian if you don't get these things right so trinity 
person and work of Christ, these kinds of things, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, these kinds of things, if we compromise there, there's no salvation. Mm -hmm. Those are primary issues. Secondary theological issues are things where we have to do one thing and not another. Mm -hmm. So in your church, I think we're, we're a Baptist church. I'm a, I'm a convictional Baptist. And so you're either going to baptize people as believers Mm -hmm. or you're going to baptize other people. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can't, I don't think have a sane uh, church. You can't have a sane church structure if you've got a mixed body where you've got babies who got baptized and and you've got believers who got baptized. You got to do one thing and not another. As an example, those are secondary theological issues. And then tertiary theological issues are issues where good people could disagree. Good Christians have been fighting about it for a long time. They're going to keep fighting about it, and we don't need to sort this all out right now. So something like uh, your view of the end times. Are you a premillennialist? Are you an amillennialist? Are you a postmillennialist? Good Christians can agree to disagree on that. We can have Revelation open on our laps Mm -hmm. in the same church and and because we're, we're all going to figure it out together is, is the reality. So that's so those are uh, those are sort of the theological order of importance in, in the theological triage. But it is true that we I think we could handle some work on ministry triage. And I've thought a lot about this. I'm actually think I might I might roll a blog out uh, on this in in the weeks ahead because I think. Uh, people need some help on this. And so I, I would I would have three orders of ministry triage as well. Uh, and in the first level of ministry triage, which is the, pr- this is where we got to get to work right now. We don't have time to think about it. We don't have time to argue about it. Mm-hmm. We don't have time to like woo people along on this. We got to, we got to get straight on these issues. And I would say those are principled theological issues. I think those are the first order theological issues that we talked about in, in theological triage. Mm-hmm. If you've got a church that has stepped away from Christ, if you've got a church that has stepped away from a faithful doctrine of God, if you've got a church that has stepped away from the perfections of the scriptures, I think that's something we just have to fix right now. Mm-hmm. We just have to fix it right now. And, and we need courage uh, and urgency as pastors, not patience. Uh, we just need to say, Hey, look, uh, it's Jesus or nothing. And that's it. Mm -hmm. The Bible either has errors in it or it doesn't. And it doesn't. And this is just where we're going to stand. And, and that's a, that's a faith once for all delivered to the saints, to the saints. I'm going to stand here. I'm going to preach this. And if I perish, I perish. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so I think when you're checking out the lay of the land in your church, if you're looking at a church that has stepped away from faithfulness and those primary theological issues, I think you have to take a stand and let the chips fall. Okay. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think we have a, an opportunity for calculation there. As I've made repeatedly clear, that's not the kind of problem we were dealing with at First Baptist, and I'm very thankful for all my predecessors and their faithfulness in the preaching ministry that, that guarded uh, the deposit of truth that we had here at First Baptist. But a, a second order issue in, in ministry triage would be the practical issues that are threatening the survival of the church. So these, this is what we were dealing with at first Baptist. Um, you can believe everything you want to believe about Jesus. You can have as high a view of scripture as it's possible to have. But if you can't turn the lights on, on Sunday morning, uh, if you can't afford staff to share those principles, uh, then all of the truth you believe is for nothing. So, so you have to look around and say, okay, how serious are our financial and logistical troubles? And is our ability to preach the gospel going into the future threatened? And if it is, you just, you're going to have to very quickly and very urgently level with your people that we have got to fix these things uh, so that we can move forward uh, preaching the gospel. And then a third order 
uh, ministry triage issue, I would say, are the sorts of practical emphases that distinguish every leader in every church and every season of church life. These are our things uh, that, you know, everybody has them. Every church has their things. Every leader has their things. Uh, every season in the church needs to have a thing. There, there are special emphases that make that church that church, mm -hmm. that make that season that season, that make that leader that leader. And bad leaders, unwise, foolish leaders, get this confused with the first order ministry issues. So, so let, let's, uh, let's pick an example of something like um, the church where you are the pastor uses a Bible translation that is different than your favorite Bible translation. Listen, this is not a first order ministry issue. This is not the first thing you need to tackle. This is the kind of thing that can wait. This is the kind of thing that can happen over time. This is the kind of thing that you can ease people into. Here's, here's the cold hard fact. Most of our English translations are really good. Most of them are. I've got my favorites. Spencer, you've got your favorite. Other people have their favorite. But most of the time, with most of these issues, these are not principled issues that are at stake in which Bible translation we're going to use. And so if you come in and you burn the house down on, you, you pick this one particular huh. emphasis and you burn the house down on that, you're just, you're hurting the church over your thing. Hmm. And you don't need to do that. Uh, if you believe that faithfulness over time would be to get us to that, um, then, um, then let's think about how to do that slowly and over time. But there, you know, at the, at the first order issues, I said, these require urgency and not patience hmm. on these third order issues. They require patience, uh -huh. not urgency. Uh -huh. So I'd break it up into those three, three levels and, and urge people to very, very carefully and very, very humbly evaluate, um, how what they're thinking, what they're doing fits into one of those categories. Okay. So I want to come back, we'll come back and I want to apply that uh, theological and ministry triage principle to culture too, because that's also what happened at First Baptist mm -hmm. with, we took theological principles and applied it to an issue in American culture that you said something in the podcast about. But before we do that, I want to actually talk about where the sexuality statement is now. Mm -hmm. um, so like, how did this age? It was controversial in our community for one reason. It was controversial with some people in our church for another reason. Mm -hmm. And both of those things have aged since yeah. it's been several months now since we've done this. How has it aged in the community and in the church? So I think really well, honestly. Uh, so when, as, as I said, this was not a thing for our church in terms of approving it, in mm -hmm. terms of saying this is who we are as a church. It just was not a thing. It was very easy for our church to do. When we made the decision to do it, we did not think we were asking the church to do a heavy lift, and we did not. Uh, but one of the things that found out once all the media attention sparked, one of the things we found as we were talking to people is that it, there was some fatigue from mm -hmm. people over that. Like, oh my goodness, I hate that we're in the media on this. I hate that we're on all the news stations about this. I hate that there's picketers out and like protesters across. Like, I hate it. And it just, even though it was very different than what we had been dealing with in the years before, it just felt like here's another thing. Yeah. And one of the things that I found myself saying a lot is, guys, listen, this is a tempest in a teapot. This is a flash in the pan if you want that analogy. And here's the thing, it's really hot right now, but this is gonna last about five seconds. And when it is over, you're gonna find that it's business as usual at our church. Nothing has fundamentally changed. You're gonna find that you come to church and everybody acts the way they always act. Everybody believes what they always believed. And this is gonna prove to be nothing. And out there in the world, they need to have a headline about this because the world has declared war on Christ and his kingdom. And so they need to have, they need to have a headline where they say, here's these, here's this other Neanderthal crazed lunatic Bible thumping people who have done this, but that can, you can only get so much play out of that and that's going to go away. And what happened is both of those things have proven true. Uh, the firestorm went away really honestly after a few days, I think it was a week at most. And, uh, 
we are now on the other side. Everybody signed. And honestly, everybody believes that sexuality statement. Everybody uh, loves that sexuality statement. And it's business as usual here. Uh, and the media has moved on and they're covering things that are the the flash in the pan for them this week. Okay. That gets into a question that I've waited to ask until this week about engagement with the city. So that was something that happened through this is we had a lot of attention with our city and we're engaging on this topic. We've had a lot of folks write in and say, okay, I know First Baptist. I know that they've had this historic door to door evangelism strategy from the eighties and nineties but y'all aren't doing that right now. Mm -hmm. So how is First Baptist engaging with the city today and seeking to reach them when things are just different now? Yeah. How does, how does the church doing that? How are they strategically doing that? We've had pastors write in of big churches of like, how do I mobilize my people to share the gospel? Right. So uh, just a refresh on the brief story that I told it in, in an earlier episode. Uh, when Homer Lindsay came here in 1969, he brought an aggressive door-to-door evangelism strategy that worked for a couple of decades. Uh, and then as the city of Jacksonville changed, uh, Jacksonville has more gated communities than any place I've ever I've ever been to. I mean, other places you go to, if you live in a gated community, you're really rich. Mm-hmm. In Jacksonville... I mean, there are some rich communities that are gated, but they're also just normal communities that are gated. I mean, there's a lot of gated communities here. So the increase of gated communities in Jacksonville, uh, all of those things uh, had an impact on the ineffectiveness of the door-to-door evangelism strategy after a couple of decades. So in 2007, they stopped it, but they didn't replace it with anything, as I pointed out. And then in 2018, we created a relational evangelism strategy that was meant to replace that. Um, And there were some things that really worked about that strategy, and there's some kinks in it that we are even to this day trying to figure out. And I would say where we are right now is we do whatever works. There's a lot of different things that we do, uh, and we will do anything that works. What, What is the command is that we must share our faith. What's open is how we do it. And there's all sorts of ways to do it. Uh, You've heard me say around here a lot that uh, one of one of my favorite quotes from D.L. Moody is, I like the way I share the gospel better than the way you don't share the gospel. Uh, so so we're for what works. We I really do think that the emphasis and the future of our congregation uh, is going to be relational evangelism. I just think there's just in our culture, I don't see any other way around that. But we also do event evangelism around here. We are getting ready. We're, as we record this, we're a few weeks away from Trunk of Treats. Uh, that is our largest outreach event of the year. We have hundreds of families that come onto our campus. Uh, We don't know who they are, but they heard about the event. They want their kids to be in a safe, sectored off place where they can get safe candy and have fun. And, uh, uh, but we also have uh, event evangelism at Christmas time with Christmas concerts. And every single one of those produces opportunities for us to get contact information to pray for and reach out and, and invite people to Christ and invite people to our church. We're really focusing on a big future emphasis on international missions. So that's not evangelism here in Jacksonville. That's evangelism on the other side of, of oceans and in other continents, but we're working on that. Um, we have response times in the service. We do that a little bit differently uh, these days than the way it was popular back in the 80s and the 90s. Um, we give we give about a half a dozen, seven or eight different opportunities for people to respond. You can respond with a, with a card after the service. You can respond in the service. You can text. You can call. You can email. There's all different kinds of ways. And every week, people respond to the gospel. With a, we have we very rarely have people come forward in a service, uh, but it's also very rare to have a service where people do not respond. They're just responding in in other ways. Uh, one of the other things that we do, I talk about this a lot. My language for it is a little clunky. I need to work on better language for it. But but around here, I call it constituency evangelism. So we're reaching out to various constituencies throughout the city. 
And just as an example of that, uh, we are spending a lot of energy in our church reaching out to police officers. We want uh, the members of JSO, the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, we want them to know that their very best friend in the city is First Baptist Church Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. We spend a lot of energy uh, reaching out to them, loving them, caring for them, caring for their families, providing meals, uh, doing a lot of stuff. Uh, we and we have other groups, teachers, uh, medical professionals. We have a we have uh, and we're going to be moving into the military uh, in the in the months and years ahead. Uh, so we're picking out groups that are constituencies that have a lot in common and uh, that we could when we when uh, we're able to spend energy reaching out to that one constituency that has has so much in common. So we're doing that. And I could keep going, but I'll just wrap up and say we're also doing door to door evangelism. We have found that there are times and places where it works. You It doesn't work uh, in most gated communities unless you live in the gated community and then 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 it works. Uh, but we've got success stories in the last couple of years of people in our church going to do door to door evangelism. And so Door-to-door -door evangelism isn't dead. It's just different than it was a couple of decades. So we're doing, we're doing whatever works. We've got the spaghetti on the wall strategy. We throw it up and whatever works, whatever sticks is what we do. That's great. Okay. Let's, uh, let's talk about, um, I want to, I want to talk about an issue that I think a lot of pastors are thinking about. We've gotten questions surrounding this issue. So our church took a stand on sexuality because you say in the episode that this is the greatest sin in American culture yes. today. So from where you're sitting today, you're a pastor of a church of over 2000 people in Jacksonville, Florida. You're thinking about ministry. You're thinking about the future. You're thinking about the cause of Christ. What are the biggest issues? Yeah. facing American Christianity that pastors have to be prepared to engage with over the next 10, 20, 30 years. Yeah. So what, what we want is we want our churches to grow and thrive in this wild, crazy, dark environment in which we're living. And what are the threats to keep that from happening? And, and I'll answer it this way. I will say there are two huge reasons, two huge categories why your church will decline. So I, I, in the first week, I think it was, I gave all these reasons for decline. Let me, let me take everything and put it under two huge headings. One heading is principled decline. If you leave the faith once for all delivered to the saints, if you stop preaching the Bible, if you stop preaching Jesus, then your church will die. And then the other is practical decline where you're not mining the store, you're not taking care of things, you're not keeping the programs up to date, you're not keeping the facilities up to date, you're not holding staff accountable and keeping them united around vision. So there's principled decline where you depart from the faith and there is practical decline where the infrastructure just starts to slouch and cave and then ultimately collapse. Now, here's the deal. You can't get prissy if, just because you don't have principled decline because they both lead to the same thing. <laughs> they both lead to no church. They both lead to no witness, no faithfulness. So both, both kinds of decline threaten our ability to be the church, and we've got to address them both. And so, so if you're a pastor listening to this and you're wondering what are the big things, I think you need to pay very close attention that you find a way to avoid the lie of our culture that we need to run away from the truth of the Bible, that we need to spruce it up, that mm -hmm. we need to step away from some of these weird antiquated teachings about sexuality or that kind of thing. Every, every drift towards liberalism in the history of Christianity starts with a well-intended desire to save Christianity from itself. Hmm. Nobody's going to believe that. We live in a different day. We're cooler now. Christianity doesn't need any saving. <laughs> Jesus is doing just fine on his own. He, he has no public relations managers. He does not need a marketing firm. He, he, is, he is doing fine as the king of the universe, and we just need to stand with him and avoid that principle decline. Uh, and then practical 
decline. Here's, here's, here's what I would say is important about this podcast. It's not my story in particular. It's that so many people resonate with my story. So here's, here's, and it's, and it's that so many people resonate with, with this church's story. So, so what happened is in the second half of the last century, these humongous churches got built up. Uh, hundreds of thousands of square feet, multiple blocks, multiple staff persons, millions and millions of dollars in budget. And those churches um, um, made sense, that structure made sense for as long as it made sense for. But we're living in a different day and everybody is trying to figure out, everybody, I'm telling you, more people reaching out to me from across the country than you could imagine, you listening could imagine, and saying, oh my goodness, this is exactly what we're dealing with. How are we going to take these huge, I say with respect, these huge monstrous facilities and operations and make them relevant mm. in a world where they don't make sense anymore? Mm. And that's a tough job. Mm. And and as I've said, so this whole podcast is about answering that part of the question. And I'm very, very clear that there isn't one size fits all. There isn't a paint by number. I'm, I'm using our uh, church as the case study to give some principles that I think are universal, but the details are going to get pressed into a million different situations in your church. And so, so I think what we, I think the two big things we've got to protect against principled decline and we have got to figure out a way to protect against the practical decline that in so many cases of people listening has already begun and already, like it was in our case, is already at a very dangerous point. And so I think what we need is a new generation of pastors who, for principled decline, will say something old. And I think we need, for practical decline, a new generation of leaders who are willing to do something new. Okay. Let me ask a quick follow-up to that. From where you're sitting, mm -hmm. are there any specific themes that you're seeing where you see pastors compromising on specific principles? Which ones do you see that are most, that, that, that right now in this moment, pastors are most tempted to compromise on? Maybe it's sexuality. I would just love to hear you talk about that. And then mm -hmm. is there think about pastors of larger churches like ours right now. Mm -hmm. Is there any patterns you're seeing on like, you've got to figure out this thing with larger churches practically mm -hmm. that if you're going to survive a, a little bit more specifically that just from where you're sitting, what do you see? Yeah. So with regard to the issues, sexuality is the easy one. Mm -hmm. Yes. There. Yes. Uh, and in fact, I even said in the, in the podcast that uh, I had pastors reach out to me. And they, they agree mm -hmm. with our position on sexuality, but they're like, Heath, don't do this. You're just painting a target on you. And my view is we've already got the target. Like there isn't, there isn't anywhere to run. I mean, if this is where the culture is broken, then this is where the culture needs Christ. And if we say we won't speak to the exact issue where you're broken and we won't speak to the exact issue where you need Christ, then I don't know what we're doing here. What, what are we doing? I mean, what? <laughs> I don't get it. This is like we were preaching uh, at, uh, we're preaching through Acts, and and we were in uh, Acts chapter nineteen last week, mm -hmm. and they're in uh, Ephesus, and they are making <laughs> these guys are getting rich off these dopey little silver um, uh, uh, idols, and Paul comes in and he's like, that idol isn't real. <laughs> It's so true. And Demetrius and all the <laughs> idol makers are like, we got to get rid of this guy. We got to get rid of him because he's saying that Artemis isn't real and he's going to bring, he's going to kill our pocketbooks is what he's yeah. going to do. That's what they say. Yeah. But Paul just walks in and he goes, you see that thing that you're making that you love so much and you spent so much money on? It's not real. Yeah. I mean, it is apostolic to identify where the culture is broken and to speak Christ into mm -hmm. that. And so... And in fact, this is what I'll say. I, I will say, apart from sexuality, the big thing that I notice all over the place is pastors <laughs> are 
one scared to death. Mm. I mean, they are just so afraid. They're afraid people are going to get mad at them. They're afraid people are going to eat them up online. They're afraid that they're afraid of everything. They're afraid of their own shadow. And so they just, they they become people pleasers. They become just yeah. obsessed with, and that's not going to go anywhere. That's not going to do anything. Or, or they're just like mad hmm. and angry and needlessly provocative. Hmm. And it's, and it's like they're swinging the pendulum too far in the other way and being like, here's what I think. And I don't care what you think. And you know, that's, I don't know how you would write that on how you'd write that in a post on X, but that's what they do. Uh, and it's like, I, I think we need folks who are going to be able to be firm and clear and not fearful without being offensive and angry and nasty and bombastic. Uh, I think, I think that's what guys hmm. have to figure out in terms of the practical. Think of a big church. Yeah. Think of a big church like ours. What do they got to figure out practically? You have got to figure out how to not make investments in infrastructure, but make investments in ministry. Hmm. So it's look, it's people, it's programs and it's places. That's what it is. You got to, you, those things have to make sense in your context. Huh. So, uh, we, we were broken with our people. I've talked about this. We had too many people and those too many people were all over the map. We had programs that didn't make any sense and our places were killing us. So in one sense, we could afford it in one sense. I mean, there, there was one sense in which if you looked at it, there were certain buildings, not all of them, but there were certain buildings and certain rooms in certain buildings that we could keep painting them and they could look okay. Um, but w when you're thinking about strategic ministry developments and having facilities that really work and not having these, in our case, not everybody's dealing with these kinds of numbers, but it's all relative, uh, you know, a $10 million bill at our church is relatively the same. Some guy might be listening to a $10,000 bill might be relatively what we were dealing with with a $10 million bill. Uh, but you have got to be able to say, we cannot hang this. We cannot have this hanging over our head. We have mm -hmm. got to make investments in Jesus. We've got to make investments in people, not staff people, but people that we're ministering to. Uh, and so we have got to bring uh, our people, our programs and our places into alignment with what we can afford so that we can be forward projecting, not just trying to keep up, not just trying to keep slapping paint mm -hmm. on antiquated facilities that are killing us. Okay. That's really helpful. All right. As we conclude, uh, I want to ask a question that gets at the past and the future. So I, d I want you to reflect one more time um, on the good things that God has done at First Baptist through all of this struggle and difficulty. So just reflect one more time on that and then pivot from there. And I'd love for you to finish by talking about the things that you are most excited about for our future, mm -hmm. the things from where you're sitting. So you look back, here's all the good things I saw God doing and all of that, whatever you want to share. And then what, are, as you look at the future for our church, this is, a lot of this has been about the past, but as you look at the future, what are the things you're most excited about for the future of our church? Okay. So good things, good through it all, good things. Um, so I would say a number of things. First, First Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Florida is a delightful place to be. That's true. And it, it was not, it was, it was a terrible place to be. I, I don't say that in any kind of insulting way on anybody. Give me a minute. I'm just saying when everybody's nasty and bickering and fighting and accusing and not trusting and thinks you're horrible, like it's just, it's just not a good place to be. And so one of the things I've said on here a couple of times is life's just too short to be at a church where you don't trust the leader, you don't trust the leaders, you don't trust the other people you're going to church. Life's just too short. Um, and we had this, um, we had this dinner, this would have been probably late 20, that probably would have been, oh gosh, everything runs together. It might've been 2021. It might've been, I'd had two or three brain surgeries. I can't remember. And uh, we were having dinner with some sweet people in the church and they said, can we tell you something? 
It was me and Lauren with them. And I said, sure. And they said, so these people who were angry and they were so mean and what they were saying in the hallway and what they were sending through the mail and what they were sending on their phone and what they were putting online. It was so terrible. And then they left and they said, and we know it hurt when all that was going on, but we want you to know that our church is so much sweeter now that they're gone. And we don't mean to say anything bad about anybody. It's just that when angry, nasty people who don't want to be there leave to go someplace they do want to be, it's just much better. And I think Lauren could correct me on this, but I think for 12 months, we did not have a lunch or a dinner with church members who didn't say something like that. This is the sweetest our church has been huh. in 20 years. Huh. Our church is really, really sweet right now. When I, I don't like being away, I don't leave very often. When I do have to leave for one thing or another, I don't like it uh, because our, just, our church is just a sweet it's true. place to be. Uh, really, really delightful. You, you know what? On the other side of that, other churches have been blessed by people who, uh, who left our church. Life's too short to be at a place you don't want to be. And so when you go someplace and you're happy to be there and you can support that pastor and you can support that ministry and you can get plugged in, that's a good thing. One of the things I've, I've told other pastors in this city is we are not counting. I am not counting Heath Lambert wins or First Baptist wins. I'm counting kingdom wins. Mm -hmm. And if a family if an individual leaves First Baptist to go to another church because they believe they can serve Jesus, they can serve uh, the kingdom better at that place than they can at our place, then that is great. Mm -hmm. And I just, I want people who are listening to this going, there's just, we're not, we have not kept negative score about people going to other church. Like if that's where you can serve Jesus better, that is great. And so I am thankful for for churches in this city who now have people who they grew up in Jesus at First Baptist Church, and now they're making investments uh, at a new church here in this city uh, and not at First Baptist anymore. That's a win for other churches, and I am thankful for that. You know, another thing that's really great is uh, what was once First Baptist Academy and is now the Covenant School of Jacksonville. Uh, so we could not, I made clear, we, we, we did not have the space for them. We did not have the money to afford that school anymore. And there's, there's two benefits, uh, to, to that separation that happened. Um, this, this was, this came up early with our board and their board. This came up early with the headmaster. Uh, everybody was on the same page on this and, and understood what needed to happen. And one of the great blessings, uh, that was true for, for, uh, for the school is that they did not have space in our downtown facilities. They didn't have, they didn't have courts. They didn't have fields. They just didn't have any room to expand. And now they are on beautiful property with space that they need sp more space than they'll ever need. And so that is thriving. And I think we can be uh, thankful for that. You know, another thing would be this podcast. Uh, uh, one of the things that we've said many, many times is the reason for this podcast is that it is inconceivable that God would not use, uh, the comfort we received during our season of pain to give mercy and help to other people. And I've heard, you have heard from people all over the country who are just saying this has been so, so helpful. Mm -hmm. So I would say, and that's just a little sample mm -hmm. of some things, but in more ways than I can list, um, there have been a lot of wonderful things that have, uh, that have flown out of it in terms of the future. Um, what am I most excited about? I'm excited about all sorts of things. You know, we're working on a long-term plan. We've, we're completing our five-year plan. Uh, it expires this year and we've made a lot of progress. And that five-year plan was about how do we, how do we survive? And this next long-term plan is going to be, okay, we have fixed these problems and the kindness of God, we're on the other side. And now how do we thrive? And so I am excited about taking steps to thrive and to grow, uh, as, as a church, not just, uh, uh, not just fix problems that need to get fixed. Cause if we don't get, get them fixed, we're going to not exist, but to fix problems that 
hey, when we fix this problem, we're going to grow. We're going to reach new people. One, one way to think about it might be, because there's so many things, there's so many individual things that I could list that that's maybe a whole other podcast of what's going to happen at First Baptist. And so we don't, we don't have time for that. But you know, if you go to the grocery store and let's say you're with a kid, I know you couldn't ever imagine this, no. but let's say you're at the grocery store <laughs> with a kid and somebody knocks over like eight glass jars of applesauce and you hear the cleanup on aisle seven. Well, you have some guy come out there and he's got a dustpan and he's got a mop and he's got one of those squirt bottles and he's cleaning this up. Well, you don't have a grocery store full of cleanup crews because the grocery store doesn't exist to clean up messes. The, the cleanup crew is there as a supplemental force because every now and then while you're selling groceries, you make messes. But, but really, the, the cleanup crew is there so that we can get this thing as cleaned up as quickly as possible and then we can move on to sell groceries. Well, the last five years or so at First Baptist has been the cleanup crew. Uh, it's, it's not the reason that we're here. We're not here just to arrange the books appropriately and get a staff that makes sense and be operating within our means. All of that is for a purpose so that we can sell groceries so that we can do the ministry of taking Jesus to this city of taking Jesus to the nations. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that is, uh, that's what we're thinking about doing. All of the work is now about, okay, now that we are healthy again, now that we are financially strong again, how do we take that health? How do we take that strength? How do we take that maturity and pour it in to people that we have not yet reached? One of the things that we're just announcing, just, just announced it for the first time last week to the church is a new campaign. Uh, we're calling it the next gen campaign. And it is a $3 million campaign. We need $3 million to invest in our next generation space because we are busting at the seams with children and with students. And so we have the opportunity to do $3 million worth of work so that we can more vigorously reach families, uh, parents and their kids or kids and their parents, depending on which way you want to say it. And one of the things that we've observed about it is we've done a lot of work around here. We've done, we've done work that's been a lot more expensive than $3 million. But this is the first campaign that hasn't been about fixing some sort of remedial problem. Mm. This is, we have more kids and more students than we have room for, and we need to expand. We mm. need to realign our facilities mm -hmm. so that we can serve the people that we're reaching. And it's solving a positive problem mm -hmm. instead of a negative problem. That is... Uh, the first time I've been able to do that since I became the senior pastor at First Baptist. And so I guess I could say I'm glad the cleanup crew has gone back behind those gray swinging doors in the grocery store. And I am excited to be solving positive problems as we reach Jacksonville in the name of Jesus. And in the kindness of the Lord, I hope I've got 20 or 30 more years to spend my life doing that. Hmm. I think that's a good way to end. Um, you know, I listened to the credits of the last episode too, and there was another yeah. person that you forgot to thank, but it would be awkward for you to thank them, which is you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just want to say thank you. Uh, well, I'm receiving emails from pastors and you're seeing some of them. I'm seeing all of them. And so many folks are reaching out and just saying, thank you so much for taking the time to tell this story and to, and to tell it very transparently with a lot of honor, with a lot of clarity and with an eye to help other people. Uh, there are people being helped and this has been an encouragement for those folks in ministry. It's been an encouragement for people who are a part of our church, even people at the Nocatee campus right now who don't know the history of our church. Mm. Uh, they're saying it's so interesting and neat and encouraging to see what God has done. So I just want to say thank you for doing this, for being faithful in the middle of a lot of trials. And uh, it's neat to see the, the fruit that the Lord is bringing because of that. Well, and thank you for saying 
almost everything I wrote on that card that I gave you. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last thank you is to everybody that's listening. We are very grateful that you've tuned in uh, every week and listen to these podcasts. We pray it's a blessing to you. And um, as uh, Pastor Heath said in, in a previous episode, you can be looking for some bonus content over the next couple of months on this channel of what happened at First Baptist. God bless. <laughs>